Good evening. I am Ellen Labby, a board member of the World Affairs Council of West Michigan and a co-chair of the Great Decisions Committee. And I'd like to welcome you here this evening for a very interesting and enlightening talk. If this is your first lecture with us, we'd like to welcome you. We hope you'll take home a brochure on the series and even consider joining us. We always like to have new members. The membership desk is out in the lobby, so please feel free to stop by on your way out the door. We're selling the Great Decisions text, which looks like this. If you'd like one, they are $18 um, and, a, and a real bargain. How many current uh, World Affairs Council members are here this evening? Please raise your hand. That's wonderful. That's terrific. How many students are here taking a class either for credit or extra credit? That's great. Welcome as well. We know we have almost 100 students from our educational partners taking the series for credit. One of our educational partners is tonight's sponsor, Grand Rapids Community College. Steve Abid, head of the Social Sciences Department, is here. Steve, where are you? Is he here? Nope. Steve is not here. Um, our media sponsor is Michigan Radio, an NPR radio station. Last week we hosted Jim Zeroli, the business reporter from NPR. We are one of the largest local sponsors of great decisions in the country. But you may have noticed that we have changed the topic on you. The Foreign Policy Association topic is Kenya. We have changed the topic to violence in the Congo. After a discussion within our local great decisions committee, oh, there he is. Everybody say hi to Steve. <laughs> say thank you. We decided that the Congolese situation is extremely serious yet hasn't had the attention of the global com community that the Kenyan situation has had. We have found one of the foremost authorities on the issue, and she is with us this evening. Not only will you learn more about the conflict in the Congo, but Dr. Atiser will use this as a case study to explore larger issues that include, number one, why do over one half of all conflicts that end in negotiated peace lapse back into war, and two, why do third-party interventions often fail to secure a sustainable peace? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Severine Otiser to Western Michigan. Hi, thanks a lot for the invitation. So to start with, if at any point during my presentation you cannot hear me, please feel free to interrupt, or if I'm too loud, please feel free to interrupt me. You can raise, you can wave, you can do anything, but I really don't want you to be uncomfortable or to miss part of the speech. So really feel free to interrupt me. Same thing, if you have any clarifying question when I'm talking because you didn't understand something that I was saying, again, feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to take any clarifying question. For substantive questions, I know we'll have quite a long discussion at the end. And again, I really want to thank you all for coming and thank the Great Decision um, Series for inviting me tonight. It's, it's really a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. And the Democratic Republic of Congo, okay, I used to I can show you. Um, the Congo is here on the map. And understanding the reasons for the failure of peace building in the Congo is absolutely essential for any person interested in current security issues, in African affairs, and in international relations. The Congolese conflict is the deadliest conflict since World War II. It has caused over 5 million casualties so far. It has destabilized most of Central and Southern Africa for the past 10 to 15 years. And even now, the Congo is host to the largest and most ex extensive humanitarian crisis in the world. The international engagement in the Congolese peace process is also not worthy. The Congo hosts the largest and most expensive peacekeeping mission in the world. The Congo was also the theater of the first ever European-led peacekeeping mission. The International Criminal Court chose Congolese warlords as its first ever cases. And overall, the, the period of a transition from war to peace and democracy 
was a period of massive international influence on Congolese affairs. And so in 2006, when the Congo held the elections that, that put Joseph Kabila into power, many observers hoped that the end of violence in the region had finally come. Journalists, Congolese experts, media specialists lauded the successful organization of the elections as finally an example of a successful international intervention in a failed state. And yet, as you may know, over a thousand civilians continue to die every day in the Congo. The eastern provinces are the theater of ongoing population displacement and massive and horrific human rights violations on a daily basis. Over the past two years, fighting in the provinces of North Kivu and in Oriental province has brought the Congo back, back to the to the to the sorry, back to um, back to almost a full-scale civil and international war. So, the question I ask tonight is why did the massive international efforts fail to help the Congo build a sustainable peace? And answering this question is important, not only to try to understand how to end violence in Central Africa, but also to answer other questions of massive significance for political scientists and for policymakers. For example, why do over half of conflicts that end in negotiated peace agreements, lapse back into war within a few years? And why do international interventions so often fail to secure a sustainable peace? Recent work in comparative politics suggests a preliminary answer. The continuation of violence during peace implementation is at least partly driven by local agenda. And when I say local, I really mean at the level of the individual, the family, the clan, the community, the municipality, the district, or sometimes the ethnic group. Why then do interveners so often neglect to address the local causes of peace process failure? And in the Congo, why did the international peace builders succeed in establish peace at the international, or regional, and national level, and not at the local, subnational level. The existing policy and academic analysis do not have much answer this question. To start with, almost no analysis of peace implementation studies the importance of local preconditions for peace settlements. However, we can infer two ideas from the existing research to explain the constant neglect of international interventions to support local conflict resolution. First, international peace builders may do their best to establish peace, but economic, political, legal, or security constraints may impair an adequate treatment of the problems at the root of the violence. Second, vested economic, political, legal, security, or institutional interests may lead some peace builders to consciously ignore violations of the peace agreements. So, do these two explanations truly account for peace building failures? Well, what I found when studying the Congo was that, of course, constraints and interest matters. But even more importantly, the dominant peace-building culture shapes intervention in a way that precludes action at the local level. Western and African diplomats, United Nations peacekeepers, and the staff of many non-governmental organizations involved in conflict resolution share a set of ideologies, rules, rituals, definitions, standard operating procedures, paradigms, um, and assumptions. This common culture influences the intervener's understanding of the causes of violence, the path toward peace, and the role 
of foreign actors. It enables international peace builders to ignore the micro level foundations necessary for sustainable peace. And regarding the international intervention in the Congo, the presence of this peace building culture explains why the massive international efforts have not yet targeted local conflicts and therefore why the international intervention has failed to help the Congo build a sustainable peace. So in this presentation, I will very briefly develop this argument. And I'm of course very happy to give you more details afterwards during the discussion. And this is how I will proceed in this talk. I will start by very briefly presenting my research methodology. And then I will present the dominant understanding of the Congolese conflict, which focuses on top-down causes of violence. And I will explain where this understanding comes from. Then I will present how international actors approached this violence and which strategy they used to end it. And again, I will present the cultural elements that oriented this strategy. I will then move on to a different analysis. Um, and I will, I will talk about an analysis that emphasizes the critical role of local conflicts and the potential of local conflict to reignite a national and international war. And after that, I will explain why the few advocates of bottom-up conflict resolution have failed to convince their colleagues to reorient their interventions in a way that took into account the critical role of local conflicts. And again, in this analysis, I will present the cultural element that sustained the resistance to change. So, in my work, the label international peace builders refers to all international actors, persons, countries, organizations, who aim at least in part to build peace in the Congo. In terms of violence, I consider only its most obvious form, physical violence against individuals or groups of people. In my analysis, I focus on the period demarcated as a transition from war to peace and democracy. So basically from June 2003 to December 2006. Because during the three and a half years, international actors exerted an unusually strong influence on Congolese affairs due to various financial, military, and diplomatic reasons. And therefore, it is the best time period to study the international intervention. But you will see that the analysis that I develop in this talk is still very relevant to understand what is going on today. My research methodology has been to alternate fieldwork in the Eastern Congo. You can still hear me? Yeah, okay. So in the villages that I put here on the map, with interviews in the Congolese capita uh, capital, Kinshasa, and in Paris, New York, Washington, Brussels, and Pretoria. Um, and, and this research design enabled me to, to, con to contrast my first-hand observation of what was going on in the Eastern Congo with data that showed how diplomats and international actors perceived the situation in the Eastern Congo. Thus, in terms of data, I draw on three kinds of sources. Field observations that I conducted in the Congo between 2001 and 2007. More than 330 interviews that I conducted with Congolese political, military, diplomatic, and civil society actors, with victims of violence, with foreign diplomats, staff of international and non-governmental organizations, um, foreign observers in the Congo, Belgium, France, the United States, and South Africa. 
Finally, I also draw on document analysis. So I looked at policy documents, uh, confidential sources, NGO and UN reports, and of course, news sources. So how did the international actors understand the Congolese conflict? Well, the first cultural element that I'd like to emphasize is that UN staff and diplomats, among with most, most of the other international interveners, are trained to analyze conflict from a top-down perspective. So in the Congo, they identified national and regional tensions as the causes of the fighting in the eastern provinces. And when I say regional tension, I mean at the level of the African Great Lakes region. So Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, Congo. And so here's the broad picture that they had in mind. The first recent war started in 1996, the second one in 1998. And during these wars, violence was caused by the 14 foreign armies present on Congolese territory and by the three main Congolese rebel groups that opposed the authority of Congolese President Kabila. In 2003, a settlement was reached at the national and regional level. Foreign troops withdrew from the Congo in spring 2003 and normal diplomatic ties resumed between former enemies. Important development also took place at the national level, such as the formation of a unified government, um, the, the official reunification of the country, and the integration of the different armed groups into, <laughs> into a single national army. I know it's really surprising. So, <laughs> integration of the different armed groups into a single national army. But during the whole time, massive insecurity persisted in the eastern provinces. As you can see on the map, you see the one in red, highlighted in red, the, the eastern provinces. And in the dominant narrative, regional and national tensions explained why violence persisted. The dominant narrative especially emphasized that some of the regional causes of violence persisted during the transition to peace. There were extensive reports of involvement from Rwanda in the Eastern Congolese provinces since the war officially ended. According to the Rwandan president, the main reason for this involvement was that rebel, Rwandan rebel Hutu militias were still present in the Congo and that they posed an important threat to Rwanda because they included some of those responsible for the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. According to many sources, Rwanda was actually more interested in pursuing two other goals in the Congo. First, Rwanda was interested in the illegal exploitation of the massive natural resources that are present on Congolese territory, and especially in the eastern provinces, because these illegal resources remained an important source of revenue for Rwanda. Rwanda was also very interested in the protection of the population of Rwandan ancestry, of Rwandan descent. This population lives in the Congo, but their life and, statu and status has been constantly threatened by Congolese indigenous group since Congolese independence in 1960. And the involvement from Rwanda generated violence in two different ways. First, it kept the Rwandan rebels in the Congo, on Congolese territory. And you may know that these Rwandan Hutu militias are responsible for some of the most horrific and extensive violence in the Congo, in the Eastern Congolese provinces. 
The Rwandan involvement also caused some Rwandan actors to support Congolese warlords and Congolese militias with arms and funding. Most international actors also emphasized that at the national level, many sources of violence persisted after 2003. To start with, the president and most former rebel leaders maintained parallel command structure over the soldiers in order to keep their territorial control and also to weaken their political enemies. This meant that the army integration process that I was mentioning before was mostly a failure. It also meant that the state could not extend its authority in the eastern provinces. So as of today, there is still no functioning justice system and no functioning police force in the eastern Congo. The dominant narrative also focused on another important national cause of violence during the transition. And this cause was the tensions between most Congolese leaders, including Congolese President Kabila, and the representative of the Congolese with Rwandan ancestry. Almost all the national leaders that did not belong to this ethnic minority use propaganda against this minority as a way to rally supporters. So in practice, it meant a lot of hate speeches that led to many abuses against the Congolese population with Rwandan ancestry. According to virtually all international interveners, in addition to these political motivations, National economic agendas also sparked a lot of violence. <coughs> National factions remained involved in the illegal exploitation of natural resources. And this involvement generated violence amongst armed groups who fought for the control of mining sites, as well as violence against the local population to get people usually to conduct the mining operations. And in the dominant narrative, the last important cause of violence, national cause of violence, was that a lot of the funds for the army were diverted. And this reinforced, this reinforced the soldiers' tendency to prey on the population, which meant stealing and usually beating, raping, torturing or even killing the people who refuse to comply. But then, international interveners could not relate all instances of violence in the Eastern Congo to these national or regional causes. So they used several interrelated frameworks of analysis to understand the violence that they could not relate to these micro-level causes. And in their view, Local violence was private and criminal. And it was the consequence of the lack of state authority in the Congo. And most importantly, foreign actors believed that violence was innate to the Congo. Most international actors that I interviewed pictured the Congo basically as an inherently turbulent country where violence was normal and to be expected. And it's important to note here that this image of the so-called Congolese, Congolese inherent savagery is actually a construct that was promoted by the Belgian colonizer in the late 19th century to facilitate colonization and a construct that for reason that I'd be happy to discuss during the discussion, a construct that has persisted up to now. So this broad understanding of violence, biased as it may have been, shaped the international intervention in the Congo. But it was not the only element. UN officials, diplomats, and non-governmental organization officials involved in the Congo 
also shared three other beliefs about, that shaped their views of what constituted the most appropriate type of foreign intervention. To start with, international actors perceive themselves as working in the face of multiple, almost insurmountable constraints. And they especially complained about the constraints posed by the environment, such as the security and logistical problems, the collapse state, and the domestic availability of valuable, easily marketable commodities. And these obstacles could have been overcome if peace builders had had massive funding and numerous well-qualified human resources at their disposal. However, peace builders always complained of material constraints. And the UN peace building mission, the MONIC, was uh, the most affected, especially in terms of lack of staff and, and also poor quality of the staff deployed in the field. My interviewees always said that all of these constraints severely limited their options for peace building. And as a result, they had to prioritize. And at that point, two other shared dominant understanding oriented which strategy took precedence. To start with, international actors conceptualized the international intervention as, ex as exclusively concerned with my cough. Will? <laughs> Is it on now? OK. Um, so to start with, you're still hearing me? OK. To, to start with, the international actors conceptualized the international intervention as exclusively concerned with the national and international realms. This macro-level focus is a central part of the very identity of international uh, organizations and also of diplomatic missions. And in the 20th century, it was reinforced by the norm of non-interference in, um, non in the domestic affairs of a sovereign state. So basically, diplomats and UN staff members are socialized in working at the national and international levels. They believe that working at this level is the only so-called natural, the only appropriate thing for them to do. And they usually have no training in working at the local level or even in analyzing local conflicts. The last cultural element that oriented the, the broad international intervention strategy is that from June 2003, until I would say late 2008, international actors labeled the Congo as a so-called post-conflict situation. And this label brought about a change of strategy for most peace builders. For example, since the Congo was officially not at war anymore, subnational actors could not be conceptualized as rebels or warring parties the actors who participated in the transition became the only legitimate partners for diplomats and UN staff. The actors who did not participate in the transition and who continued to wage violence were labeled illegal, and therefore diplomats and UN staff were not supposed to meet with them. So at that point, mediation between different combatants was not an, an option anymore because at least one of the parties was considered illegitimate. And these three shared understandings set the precondition for the choice of a peace and state building strategy concerned almost exclusively with elections. As you know, reconstructing a state entails many measures, including rebuilding a bureaucracy, a justice system, disciplined and effective coercion forces, 
and selecting appropriate leaders, usually through elections. Well, in the Congo since 2003, the international interveners have focused almost all of their financial, logistics, and, financial and, um, and human resources on only one of these tasks, the selection of leaders through elections. And we can easily locate the reason for this focus in the ideological environment of the post-Cold War era. Building democracy has now become equated with only holding elections. And all major international bureaucracies see elections as a workable, appropriate, and effective tool for peace and state building. Therefore, throughout the entire transition, diplomats and UN staff members focused most of their limited resources on the organization of elections. And they saw all of the other state and peace building tasks as secondary priorities that they had to approach, if they had to approach them at all, they had to approach them again in a top-down fashion. And there was only one exception to this top-down approach, and that was humanitarian and development aid. Aid workers, as you know, constantly interact with the local populations in order to conduct their daily humanitarian tasks. And all international actors perceived this specific kind of international involvement as perfectly legitimate and perfectly, and perfectly respectful of the sovereignty of the Congolese state because they viewed development and humanitarian aid as apolitical. Again, we have to note that this image of relief aid as a technical, neutral, apolitical task is a historical construct that aid workers have built up in the past century to facilitate their action. So overall, to sum up, the intervention strategy focused at the macro level and especially on organizing general elections. General elections were held in 2006. And these elections officially marked the, success, the, successful the successful completion of the transition from war to peace and democracy. However, extensive violence persisted um, in the eastern provinces. So I'm going to try again to show you that. So the eastern provinces, basically the Kivus at their Oriota province and a little bit North Katanga. And again, the Congo remained the largest, most extensive humanitarian crisis in the world. And as I mentioned earlier, we are now back to a full scale, almost a full scale international and national war. So why did the international intervention fail? Well, there are many reasons, such as this exclusive focus on elections. While we know from experience that elections organized shortly after the end of a war will usually fuel violence without even building democracy. There is also the lack of attention to the reform of the security sector, basically to rebuilding the army and the police. And also the lack of efforts on rebuilding the justice system. The insufficient diplomatic pressure on foreign and Congolese elites so that they stop fueling violence. But the one crucial reason that people usually fail to mention is the international neglect of local tensions. Because it is entirely true that there were regional and national causes for the continuation of violence during the war, during the transition, and even now. But contrary to the dominant narrative that I presented, the ongoing conflict is also motivated by distinctively local causes. In other words, violence in the Congo is not purely the consequence of these regional and national tensions. And we can identify 
several distinctively local causes of violence that are not related to criminality or barbarism as in the dominant narrative. So first, there were important social motivations in being part of a militia and in continuing to wage violence. For example, lack of social opportunities and the fact that being a member of a militia or even better, better being the leader of a militia was the best way for the uneducated and the disenfranchised to, cl to, um, to claim resources and to claim a social status that the traditional order denied them. Another social motivation was the threat of retaliations against those suspected of having wronged their neighbors or collectivities during the war. Political issues were key as well in generating conflict. There was a lot of competition at the village or district level over who would be chief of village, who would be chief of a district, who would be chief of a territory, who would be the highest rank individual, family or ethnic group. And this kind of conflict had existed all throughout Congolese history, but the war added yet another layer of complexity. Because now, on top of all the pre-existing conflict, there was now a competition between the traditional authorities and the authorities put in place during the war and during the transition. There was also a lot of conflict over who could be appointed to local administrative positions. And all these kinds of political antagonism led to extensive violence during the transition and many times escalated into national or regional fightings. And these political tensions usually interfaced with economically motivated hostilities because political power guaranteed access to land and resources. Well, access to land and resources means the ability of fund to buy arms and continue fighting. So the economic competition usually revolved around the two key sources of wealth in the Congo, land and mineral resources. So people talk a lot about the illegal exploitation of resources and how it motivates a lot of violence and a lot of fighting. <coughs> it's true, but the stakes of land distribution are similarly very high. Land provides the main means of survival to most rural Congolese families. And owning land is also the primary means of integrating the local social structure. So for centuries, there has been a lot of small and large scale fighting that had at its core the distribution and the exploitation of land. And of course, this fighting continued during the transition and it still continues now. And these economic and political issues often, often motivated local alliances with the Rwandan Hutu militias. Remember the Rwandan Hutu militias I mentioned about 20 minutes earlier. It's very important to keep this in mind because the dominant part narrative, as I said earlier, present these Rwandan Hutu militias as a purely predatory militia. Basically, the story is that they stay in the Congo because they cannot go back to Rwanda. And therefore, they prey on the Congolese population and they use violence in order to survive. Okay, that's true, but it's not the entire story. In my fieldwork, I actually discovered that the Rwandan Hutus were not purely predatory militias. So it was not purely a, a, an issue between Rwanda and the Congo, a regional issue between Rwanda and the Congo. The Rwandan Hutu militias did have a lot of local support from grassroots militias, from soldiers and commanders in the Congolese Unified Army, and from local administrative authorities. And these local alliances were key 
to perpetuating the presence of Rwanda and Hutu militias on Congolese territory, and therefore the tensions between Rwanda and the Congo, and also the violence that these militias perpetrated against the Congolese population. Without local allies, the Rwandan rebels would not have been able to defend themselves against their enemies. They would not have been able to trade with the local populations, and they would not have been able to access the arms and resources that they used to continue fighting. And similarly, the dominant narrative presents the problem with the population of Rwandan descent, with Rwandan ancestry, as a purely national or regional issue. But again, there was an important local component in this so-called regional tension. Local issues around land and traditional power were at the root of the ethnic tension that developed before the war between the indigenous communities and the population with Rwandan ancestry. And during the transition, the local stakes were similarly very high. There was still a lot of tension around local access to land, around local access to traditional and political power by people of Rwandan descent. And it led many times to localized fighting, and several times it escalated into national and regional fighting and threatened <coughs> the national and regional peace settlement. So, to sum up, during the Congolese transition, violence was motivated not only by the regional and national causes that we hear so much about, but also by local, distinctively local causes. There was a constant interaction between the local and the national and the regional causes of violence, namely alliances between local actors and national and regional actors. But after the war officially ended, local actors and local agendas became increasingly autonomous from the national and regional tracks. And the local dynamics of violence became increasingly self-sustaining. So basically, it happens mostly in the eastern provinces that I showed you earlier on the map, in South Kivu, North Katanga, and Ituri. And at that point, it generated fighting that no national actors, no regional actors, and no international actors could stop. So, therefore, the international intervention should have addressed the tensions, not only at the international and national level, as they did, but also at the local level. And throughout the transition, there were several attempts at promoting bottom-up conflict resolution and the analysis that I just developed. And these attempts came from a handful of diplomats, a handful of civilian members in the UN peacekeeping mission, and quite a few of the local peacebuilding organizations present in the Congo, and then a lot of Congolese human rights activists and peace activists. And all these peoples try to convince the international interveners that they should adopt a bottom-up peace-building strategy, but they failed. And so throughout the transition, and even now, there, is, there was barely no peace-building action at the local level. And it's puzzling, because international interveners could have easily um, included, included local peace-building initiatives in their existing strategy. For example, to minimize the cost and to minimize international interference, donors could have supported local NGOs and local civil society representatives with fundings and logistics, which grassroots organizations were constantly asking for when they were meeting with international actors. And to find the resources to support local conflict resolution, International actors could have either shifted their priority away from these rapid elections that were so detrimental to the Congo, or they could just have increased their aid budgets. 
And donors, the UN, international NGOs, and local NGOs could have focused on two high priority areas, resolving land conflict and promoting inter-community reconciliation. And just these two areas of focus and these two programs would have assuaged a lot of the, cause of, of the local causes of violence. And in addition, UN actors and diplomats could have considered stepping in to resolve the few local military and political problems that grassroots civil society actors were not equipped to address. So why did the largest peace building bureaucracy reject these opportunities for change? Well, there are two main reasons, which again bring us back to the influence of cultural elements. First, the suggested strategy jeopardized many organizational interests. For bureaucracies such as the UN and the diplomatic mission, considering working on local conflict would have challenged their very identity because, as I explained before, their identity centered on the notion that they were macro-level international organizations. Considering working on local conflict would also have meant embarking on an extensive process of change to create new departments, new standard operating procedures, and new funding and operating patterns. And all of this work would have been challenging and highly time consuming. The second reason for the failure of reform attempt was that the suggested strategies clashed with deeply entrenched cultural norms. The norm of non-intervention in the domestic affair of a sovereign state and the deep-seated belief that democracy through elections is the best answer to war and violence. So as a result, there was intervention at the local level only in the case of shocking events. In the Congo, four kinds of events proved so shocking that they overcame the international habituation to local violence and that they brought about intervention to finally stop violence and local violence. The first was that supposedly it was when supposedly peaceful areas suddenly flared up, such as Ituri in 2002. The second was like a crisis, was when a crisis looked like a potential genocide, again, such as Ituri. The third was when international peace builders were so targeted, such as happened in Ituri and also in South Kivu in 2006. And finally, the last shocking event was when violence was particularly gruesome or spectacular, such as happened in, in Ituri several times, and such as happened also with the massacres committed by the Rwanda and Hutu militias. And the second kind of element that overcame the international habituation to violence was the recognition that an escalating crisis threatened the national and regional settlements, as became obvious several times during the transition. And for each element, the mechanism was similar. It pushed local violence back into the realm of the abnormal. It also eliminated, sorry, it also eliminated the political, military, and economic and social dimensions of the local conflict. So it prompted a recategorization of the Congo as a war situation. And therefore, international interveners switched to strategies that were appropriate for war environment. The problem is that these shocking events did not alter the other cultural elements that oriented the international intervention and that I detailed earlier. So, the intervention to stop local violence was mostly top-down, it was not bottom-up. And the intervention was basically only to bring back the violence to a level that was considered as normal, so-called normal for the Congo. 
And that was, again, as I explained before, that was actually a high level of violence. And otherwise, in the absence of shocking events, a vicious circle developed. The perception of local conflict resolution as a long-term, unfamiliar, and illegitimate task turned local level constraints on international actions into insurmountable obstacles. And this in turn reinforced the perception of bottom-up peace building as a negligible and unmanageable issue. So what did we learn? And how can people who do not work on the Congo actually use this analysis? Well, in, sorry. In the book, um, I suggest a new theoretical approach to the study of international peace building failures in the Congo, the rest of Africa, and beyond. The dominant international peace building culture shapes the intervener's understanding of peace, violence, and intervention in a way that overlooks the micro level foundations necessary for sustainable peace. The resulting inattention to local conflicts leads to unsustainable peace building in the short term and to war resumption in the long term. And if you're interested during the discussion, I'm happy to show you how this analysis can help better understand other cases, many other cases of international intervention failures in Africa and elsewhere. Local conflicts are usually critically important in motivating violence in multi-war and post-war environments. And the international peace building culture almost always preclude international action at the local level. And of course, I have developed extensive policy recommendations on how to reform the peace building world so that peace builders can be equipped to approach local conflict that fuel violence at the local, national, and international levels. And I'd be happy to talk about these policy recommendations during the discussion if you're interested. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? No. 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 If I stand near you, I have two mics. Oh, <laughs> oh you, she's got two mics in her. Maybe I need to bring it. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Well, thank you very much. That was very, very enlightening, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Uh, we have two mics, one on either side, so if you do have questions, Dixie's got one over there, and I think some, you can see a hand. Okay, great, there's a mic over there. I just have one question. I was noticing on those little ballots that we have um, in the uh, brochure that we got this evening that there, there are a couple of questions. And one of the things that I didn't know and I wanted to ask Dr. Oxer was, um, what is R2P? Okay, is the mic still working? Yeah. Okay, great, fantastic. Um, RTP stands for the responsibility to protect. Basically, it's a new doctrine um, that's very influential at the United Nations. And um, it, it's part of the whole debate about humanitarian interventions. Basically, do we have a responsibility to protect populations that are in danger and that are the subjects of war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide and mass violence. And um, I, I spare you all the details, but basically there was a report in 2001, and then uh, the report made recommendation. And basically the, the main recommendation was that um, a sovereign state, a state has the responsibility, the primary responsibility of protecting its population. But when this state is unable or unwilling to protect this pop its population, then this responsibility should be borne by the broader community of state. 
And um, this doctrine called R2P, uh, this doctrine was actually um, was um, was actually transformed into uh, a UN resolution in 2005 and, and 2008. It was approved by the community of states, by the UN General Assembly, by all the representatives of the states that, are, that belong to the UN. And then it made its way into the resolution, for example, in, into the constitution of the African Union. And it has been reaffirmed by many different states. So there is still an ongoing debate, as you can imagine, um, with the idea that when it's sovereign state cannot protect its population, then there is a right uh, and a duty for international interveners, so for any other country to actually intervene and go and protect the population. So there is an ongoing, um, an ongoing debate, but it has become very influential, and it's one of the, of the concept and one of the central ideas that is behind all the UN mandates to protect the population, all the UN peacekeeping mandate to protect the population in Darfur and in the Congo. Are there any questions? Um, I can see I one a, right here. We have these magic mics here. Okay. Try it without a mic. <laughs> what are the resources? Where are they? And who buys them? Okay. Um, what are the resources? Mineral resources, uh, a lot of gold, a lot of diamond, a lot of coltan. It's uh, basically Colombo tantalite, and it's uh, one of the minerals that's central to cell phone and electronic equipment. And the Congo has, I think, 95% of the reserve of uh, the world's cost, coltan. So basically, if we don't access coltan in the Congo, we have no cell phone, we have no computer. So um, there is also timber. Um, I mean, virtually all the precious minerals, you can find them in the Congo. They are located, let me try without, um, without destroying the sound system, let me try to show you a map of the Congo and show you where they are located. Uh, yeah, that will do. Okay, so they are located a lot in the eastern provinces al along the border, and then a lot in the southern belt of the Congo. So it's a lot southern and eastern Congo, and then a couple in northern Congo, a couple in western Congo. Um, and the last part of the question was who buys them? Yeah. Um, everybody. Basically, I'm sure all of, you, all of you have a cell phone here, so probably all of you have some coltan in your pockets, and it means that we're all part of the illegal exploit. I mean, we're all benefiting from the illegal exploitation of natural resources. Um, diamond from the Congo, they end up everywhere. Uh, tin, timber from the Congo end up everywhere. Gold from the Congo ends up everywhere. So the, there are ramifications virtually everywhere. Um, in uh, North America, in Europe, in Africa, in Latin America. Rachel, do you have someone with a? <coughs> okay. What application for your theory of addressing violence at the local level do you see for countries outside of the Democratic Republic of Congo? Thank you. Um, I, I see. I see quite a wide application. For example, let's talk about Darfur, that is always on the front page of the newspaper of these days. Well, when you look at the causes for, vi for uh, violence in Darfur, you have again these national and regional causes, and, and we're all familiar with those. But also, a lot of the fighting is about land in Darfur. It's just like in the Congo. A lot of people are fighting about land, and they are fighting about identity issues that are really rooted at the at the local level. And again, these issues should be addressed at the local level, and there have been calls by Darfuri activists and by uh, think tanks like the International, um, International Crisis Group, and they were asking the international interveners and the UN peacekeeping mission to address the local conflict, and nothing. You can think about Kenya as well. Well, Kenya, that, was, uh, that may have been the topic of, of, the, of the talk tonight. Kenya, um, you, when you look at the patterns of violence, the patterns of violence were actually around local issues. 
they were organized over local issues and, and a lot around competition over land and around resources. And in Kenya, there was actually a very strong civil society, local Kenyan civil society, and lots of local organizations. And Kenya is a rich enough country so that these organizations had the resources and the support to do local peace building, and therefore violence went back to a level that was um, that was mostly, um, I mean, went back to a level that was mostly manageable. And then you can look at, I mean, the, the role of land and the importance of land in fueling violence is something that you can see in, um, in Southeast Asia. Um, it's something that you can see all over in Central and Latin America. You know, the, the, the campesinos and the role of land in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, in Colombia, it's in Brazil. It's something that's very well known. And again, there is very little on, uh, on local conflict resolution. We can talk about Northern Ireland also, where you see that local conflict resolution initiatives, really like reconciling people within, within a village or within a city, has actually been traced as one of the, one of the uh, reasons for the 2000, I think it was 2007, return to a relatively peaceful situation in Northern Ireland. So basically, my, my claim is that um, addressing local conflict and addressing local violence will not end <laughs> the violence everywhere. It's, it's not the silver, um, how do you say in English? Silver bullet. Um, but it, I mean, but if we want to have a good, um, a good peace building strategy, we should consider the role of local conflicts. And I would say that in most conflict, there is a role for local conflict resolution. And in many African and non-African countries, there should be a significant role for local peace building and local conflict resolution. Hi, I think you've got a dog. Here, yes, Hi. <laughs> I have the projectors in my eyes, so there. Okay. Oh, here. <laughs> Hi. Uh, some of the literature on African conflicts is talking about um, uh, sort of uh, uh, farmers versus herders conflict right? as an early warning for a larger conflict. Do you see the same pattern in Congo? And uh, if so, uh, I'm assuming that has to do with the uh, land reform policy suggestions that you developed. So if you could talk about this land reform policy suggestions that you perhaps you developed and uh, talk how that would influence the conflict. Thanks. Sure. Yes, um, I, I didn't frame the analysis in, in, in the language former herd of conflict, but that's exactly what is going on. You remember when I was talking about the tensions between the Congolese population with Rwandan ancestry and the indigenous Congolese? Well, the indigenous Congolese are basically the farmers, and the Congolese population with Rwandan ancestry are usually the herders. And there is a lot of clashes because the farmer wants to grow um, you know, crops uh, on, on their land, and then they complain that the cattle actually destroyed the crops and they destroyed the land, and there is a lot of competition about who's going to access land and to do what. Is it to grow crops or is it to have your cattle? And cattle is very, very important for uh, the Congolese population of Rwandan ancestry, and especially for the Tutsis, because it's a, a source of wealth. Just to give you uh, to give you an anecdote, I, I, I remember like many times when, when I'm meeting with co with friends, Congolese friends with of Rwandan ancestry, they always have on their cell phone pictures of their cows. <laughs> and, and and when I'm back to for here to New York, I keep on receiving picture of cows all the time. Uh, so just to show you how important it is. And so yes, when I talk about conflict around land, that's exactly what I'm what I'm talking about. Like trying to find a solution so that both the cattle her the, the, the cattle herders and uh, the agriculturers can find a way can find enough land so that they can pursue their own activity and, and they don't have to fight with one another to have enough land. And um, the land reform that I'm thinking about is that well, I mean there, there is a one of the huge problems in the Congo is that um, for historical reasons, you have overlapping ownership patterns. So basically, you have the traditional uh, legal system, and then you have the modern legal system. And, and as a result of that, of the traditional pre-colonial legal system and the colonial and post-colonial legal system, you, ha you can have two or three people who have legal ownership over the same, pa the same piece of land. 
And of course, they're all going to start fighting with one another because if they don't get this piece of land, basically they cannot survive, they cannot feed their family, they're losing their cows and the beautiful cows that are also important, etc., etc. So, um, so what the, the one thing that we start we need to do is first to um, to clarify the legal system. And, and to find to decide which legal system uh, should apply in the Congo, and therefore, basically, whoever the, the contenders can have access to land. And then we need to find uh, we need to to have local conflict resolution groups in each village to decide what to do. Once we know what is the law and and what is the rule, then we decide what do we need to find a solution that's fair to all the parties because they all have a legitimate claim on land. And uh, the villages I've, I've been to in the Congo have always found like really innovative and, 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 and fantastic solutions. So for example, it's going to be you have two families that are, that are vying over the same piece of land and that there is one house and they are all both saying that the house is theirs. So then one, they will cultivate the land together for five years and they're going to share the product of the, of, 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 um, the product of the land and then one family will help the other family build a second house so they can, that they can both have a house and within five years afterward I mean, the very very complicated story but basically it's a story it, it's an idea that can work only when you think about it and when you find a solution on a really really local level on an individual basis so my analysis is we need to have an overall framework that's clear and that doesn't lead, uh, give rise to any kind of confusion. And then we need to have an army of local peace builders and local justice officials that will go to each village and, and help resolve each conflict according to what the community, the local community thinks it's best and what the families that are in conflict think it's best and try to find a consensus conflict by conflict. I have a question. Um, hello. I'm interested in getting your thoughts on a comparison between the Congo and West Africa. Mm -hmm. You'll be familiar with R.D. Kaplan's now classic work on the coming anarchy, how scarcity, crime, overpopulation, criminal anarchy, and the ecological crisis are rapidly destroying the social fabric of our planet. And is there a viable comparison between Congo and West Africa, right? Are previously coherent identities unraveling? And what is the root causation of conflict in the Congo, and how can it be alleviated? Right. <coughs> Basically, the analysis that I presented to you here is a refutation of Kaplan. I do, sorry. <coughs> Basically, Kaplan's thesis is that everything um, that violence in West Africa is due to um, <clears throat> is, is basically due to chaos, due to social anarchy, and uh, there is a, a, a very strong undertone of uh, what I say is racism. It's basically thinking that West Africans are inherently violent and uh, they are fighting, they are barbaric, and he talks a lot about the barbarism of the West Africans. And that's what I traced in when I was presenting the dominant narrative, that's what I stressed as one of the frameworks that international actors were using to explain the violence that they could not explain. Basically, it's okay, everything is international and national causes, and when it's not, it's just that Africans are barbaric. I think it's a, I mean, it's, <coughs> it's wrong, it's inaccurate, and uh, it's, it's kind of a really lazy analysis. I mean, I don't agree with Kaplan, as, as you can see. I, I really think that, um, that if, we look, if we look at what we think is barbaric violence, uh, we can understand the motivations behind it. We can understand the causes, and the causes lie at the local level, uh, local social, political, and economic causes of violence. And it doesn't, I mean, I'm not saying that the violence is not horrific. The violence is definitely in West Africa, as in the Congo, some of the most horrific violence that has happened in the world. But it doesn't mean that we should not try to understand the causes and we should not explain it. Because if we say, well, it's just pure barbarism, then what do we do from there? 
we do nothing, and it's what Bill Clinton did with uh, with Yugoslavia. It's basically, oh, they've been fighting for centuries. They are they are naturally barbaric, and therefore they they should not be any intervention. And then we let the Yugoslav fight each other and kill each other, and basically that led to the whole massacres in Srebrenica, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't think that's the way to go with Western Africa or with the Congo. We, try, we should try to understand what are the causes of violence. And once we have a good grasp of that, which is not all they are barbaric, but which is actually they are fighting for reasons that we can understand intellectually and that we can relate to, then we are better placed to help Afri um, Congolese or West Africans uh, approach this conflict and, and build a sustainable peace. And you were asking about the root causes of this violence. Well, again, I really think that the root causes of this violence in West Africa and in the Congo are the same. You have the regional, you have the national, you have the local causes. If you take Liberia, that's one of the major cases of, of Kaplan's analysis. Liberia, you can see the, the regional dimension is very clear, the national dimension is very clear, but there is also a lot of conflict, of local conflict around identity and, um, and around local citizenship. And here, the, the, the work of Martin Boas is very interesting on, on these local um, subnational um, level conflicts and, and how they are, even now, how they are actually in the process of destabilizing parts of Liberia while the rest of Liberia is at peace. So I think you can really draw a, a really interesting comparison between the Congo and Liberia, and I'm sure you can, you can also relate to Ivory Coast and the role of land and to Sierra Leone and, and other West African countries. Thank you very much for, for a very enlightening talk. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of points. One is you've indicated essentially that the foreign presence with regard to UN peacekeepers by necessity must be related to a long-term commitment in order to be effective. In relation to that, given that, oh, approximately only 50, 52, 53% of the women are literate. Is it, in your view, important that a women's empowerment initiative be established in order to foster peacekeeping and stability in the DR Congo? Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's it's crucial, it's essential. Um, not only literacy program, but but empowerment on a more general level, uh, so that they have access, better access to political power, to social power, to economic power. And what's what I find really interesting about the Congo is that women are actually there are a lot of women's group, uh, women's peace building group. And when I'm talking about the the human rights activist and the peace activist, I I picture a lot of Congolese women in my mind. Uh, some some of them have fantastic initiatives and traveling to, to, to various places and trying to convince uh, their male counterpart that they should stop fighting or trying to convince their son because they are very well respected as mothers. So convincing their son that they should stop fighting and women have definitely a critical role in peace building and, 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 and they, are, they are actually fulfilling this role in the Congo. Eastern Congolese women are, are very innovative and very active. Um, and, and so for, for that, they, they are really already doing a lot. And there is also a lot of uh, programs I've seen from the non-governmental organizations, from the United Nations, trying to help women mobilize and trying to help women build some capacity to, to have more power and, and, and to, be, um, to be more effective in their peace building work. So, of course, it's, it's not perfect and it's not sufficient. When, when you look, and it's, I mean, it, it works quite well when you look at civil society organizations because women are very vocal, but then it doesn't translate into any kind of result at the provincial and national level. When you look at the gender distribution in the parliament, um, the gender distribution is, I mean, it's, it's 90, 95% men. Uh, it's, uh, problematic. Um, same thing at the in the national parliament. It's, it's mostly men. So so there is still a lot more work to do um, on that. And and the UN has a gender initiative, but the, the UN basically they are trying to do everything, and so they cannot do anything like really really in depth. Um, and the NGOs 
the NGOs cannot do everything. I mean, they, they need to have more support from, from diplomatic missions and from, from other international organizations. So there is an effort, but definitely we, we should increase this kind of efforts and, and, and empower women because, because many of them are already at, at the very local level, they already have a very, a very good influence. Thank you. Sure. Are you familiar right here? Um, uh, this is not the Congo, but I'm talking about the uh, bottom-up model that Greg Mortensen has used, and he writes about it in his book, Three Cups of Tea, and he has also written about it in a new book that's from uh, Stones to Schools, and it has to do, uh, he was work, is working in Afghanistan, uh, and against the Taliban and to educate little girls. Are you, uh, are you familiar with that bottom-up model? I've, I've read about this book. I haven't read the book itself. Okay. I just th think it seems that the wonderful things you are talking about also parallel there very well. And I do understand that the U.S. <coughs> Uh, government that the generals ha are all reading his books uh, who are in Afghanistan. Well, actually, it, it kind of relates to the to the overall U.S. strategy. You, 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 you've read probably also about the fact that now um, General Petras wanted to have anthropologists embedded in the army so that uh, the anthropologists would help the, uh, the U.S. teams, the, the, the soldiers, better understand local conflict because he realized, and, and it was something that actually worked in, uh, in Afghanistan, he conducted a, p a pilot project, and when you had an anthropologist in the army that helped the soldier understand the local conflict and do some local conflict resolution, the need for combat, for you know, violent military combat, decreased by 60%. So there has been a huge, now it's, 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 it's the new thinking in how to resolve the conflict in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Many people are talking about this kind of bottom-up approach. So I haven't read the book that you're talking about, but it, it totally fits into this, this ongoing debate about whether it, it would actually be a good idea to do more local conflict resolution, bottom-up conflict resolution in Afghanistan and Iraq. The problem is that, again, it, it remains, uh, I have a friend doing research on exactly this topic on, on Afghanistan, and she says that this idea of having local conflict resolution remains one of the cutting edge, uh, really new idea. That's something that they would love to do one day, but it's not mainstream. They don't, they don't do a lot of that. It's, it's like they have their, their pilot project that they, they wave at us and they're like, oh, we're doing something. Um, but it, it's, it, it remains, or we're supporting this wonderful organization, but it, it remains really, really minor compared to all the needs there is for local conflict resolution. Thank you. Sure. Um, are you, you use an interesting term, which is peace building, um, which gets one very close to nation building versus peacekeeping. When you really talk about your peace building, aren't you presupposing a significantly higher level of resource commitment to provide significantly higher levels of security in order then to engage in the, what I would call nation building, as a way to solve these problems? And is there really any international commitment of the kind of resources that would be necessary to in fact achieve what would be clearly a very good ideal kind of solution? Yes and no. Meaning that uh, there is already a quite high commitment to the Congo. The, the peacekeeping mission uh, gets a billion a year, a billion dollars a year. It's the most expensive peacekeeping mission in the world. So there is significant resources. And also international actors, the European Union and the US mostly, uh, spent I think $670 million on the organization of the elections. And this was, what I'm saying is that we need to redistribute these resources. I mean, ideally, 
ideally we would spend much more resources and help the Congo build peace and democracy. And, and instead of having 1 billion or 600, 670 million, we would have 10 times that amount or even more. Uh, and I know that would be an ideal world and unfortunately we don't live there. Um, so I, what, I, what I'm saying is that we have limited resources, but some of these resources are being wasted. For example, the organization of elections was for, for many reasons, it was wasteful because it didn't, um, we, we knew from the start that it wouldn't build, build peace, it wouldn't build democracy, it would actually reinforce the authoritarian tendency of the government and it would reinforce the conflict in many provinces. So all these $670 million, uh, million dollars could have been devoted to other priorities and they could have been devoted to local conflict resolution. And with $670 million, you can do a lot in terms of local conflict resolution. Because the good thing with local conflict resolution is that it's cheap. You really need, I mean, when I was talking with local peace builders, with Congolese peace builders, they were talking about, please give me $50. I need $50 to travel to this village because I know I can organize this activity in this village and, uh, and, we can, and, and, and stop the conflict there. But I don't have this $50. So some of the project, of course, if you want to work in more villages, it's more expensive, but you can really do a lot with the existing resources. Same thing, we have this huge international peacekeeping mission with all the soldiers. We have all these civilian staff members who have focused most of their work on the organization of elections. They could have worked more on local conflict resolutions. They were already there. They could have worked more on local conflict resolution and that would have helped the Congolese grassroots organizations. Same thing for the diplomats that we have there that focused all of their energy on the organization of elections. They could have helped with local conflict resolution. So again, I. I, I really think that if, if we stop spending money on, uh, on priorities that are, uh, let's say, politically correct, but that really hurt the country, then we can devote these resources to, um, to other priorities that will better help uh, the Congo or other country build peace and build an actual bottom-up democracy. This will have to be our last question. Uh, Dr. Otis here, we're over here, and this is our last question. Thank you for your talk. Um, in view of the fact that uh, there have been elections in the Congo, in your estimation, with the Congo, the Congolese national government, the regional governments, welcome local, inter local intervention, or would they see it as interference in their sovereign state? Uh, I could not help but notice that even the Haitian government, you know, bristled at the, the more that needed help that uh, that the international community was trying to provide for them in their you know in, in their horrific need. Uh, what what is your estimation of the attitude toward uh, any if any help on the local level, and uh, if if these governments would allow it or these these uh, components of the governments would allow it. Uh, is there enough, are there enough resources, human resources already there to provide some of this? Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it really depends on, on how on how we support local conflict resolution. Um, my, the, the strategy I'm advocating for is that um, the, the resources that are, the human resources that are already in place support local organizations. So support Congolese organizations and that we really put the Congolese in the driver's seat, meaning that the Congolese local organizations decide what kind of conflict uh, they think is a priority, how they should go about resolving it, and then that they involve the local populations into finding a solution for this conflict. And that's the kind of local level, uh, kind of de development kind of project that is much more palatable so to sovereign states um, and to, uh, to, co to, co to government like the Congolese government. And we can perfectly take them on board and, and have the national and provincial authority actually participate in that by giving a framework for local conflict resolution. And for example, when I was talking about how to resolve land conflict and I was mentioning, well, we need the government to give uh, a broad framework and that's you know the prerogative of the national government. And then we just give like capacity building and support and money and logistical help to the grassroots Congolese organizations. So I think this kind of interference 
is actually much more acceptable to a sovereign state than just you know, intervening and, and having someone like me or you or anybody in this room just going and say, hey, we're gonna resolve your local conflict. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, also, and, and also it's much more cost effective um, because, because they, I mean, the, the local Congolese organization know what they are doing. I wouldn't know how to start to resolve a local conflict in a village I don't know, and nor would any of the peacekeepers there. So, so I think for that, um, that, would be, that would be probably okay. The other thing is that um, when you think about the Congo, like in the past few years, the international interveners have actually wrote, written the Congolese constitution, the Congolese and the Congolese nationality law. So they didn't actually write it, but the Congolese, um, the Congolese um, parliament was writing it and then would send a draft to basically a committee of the most powerful international state that were supervising the transition, so basically the US, US Great Britain, France, etc. And then the, the diplomats would get around the table, look at the draft and say, oh, this is not acceptable, this is not acceptable, this is bad, this is bad, and then send back the draft to the legislature, to the Congolese legislature, saying, okay, either you rewrite this constitution or we cut all funding. And the international actors were actually financing over half of the Congolese budget. So, and the Congolese government basically accepted with this kind of international interference because it had no choice. So I think from, you know, I, I, I think that from, when you're thinking about like U United States government or the French government or, or other kind of government saying, oh, we'll, we cannot interfere in local conflict resolution because it's a domestic affairs and we're not legitimate for interfering. I think it's, it's kind of a hypocritical reason. Like they're saying, well, we can write the Congolese constitution and we can write the Congolese nationality law, but we cannot help them resolve local conflict. And then finally, in terms of resources, again, it really depends on the kind of intervention that we're talking about. If it's like you know, international like foreigners coming and resolving local conflict, then we don't because we would need too many people and we would need people who are not trained to do that and, and none of us has the knowledge and the capacity to do that. Now, if we, if we think of, have, of international actors or mainly facilitators supporting, how, identifying uh, the local peace builders uh, that work in the areas that, that, that really need local peace building, and then helping these, uh, these people with funding, with finance, with logistics. So just being an intermediary between you know, the high financial institution that, that needs reports and things that are super complicated to write and things that we know how to do, and then the Congolese peel builder who actually know how to use the money once we get them, then I think this we can find the resources and we just need to replace some of the political scientists we have uh, in the Congo by anthropologists and, and by people who are actually trained in, result, in analyzing local issues and, and helping and working with, uh, with local actors. Sure. Thank you so much. talking about using peace building tools. Military might doesn't always do it. Thank you so much for coming this evening. We're adjourned and please drive safely. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> I've been working on it for a while. Isn't it a fascinating topic?